Hello everyone, it's March 18, 2012, and this is a follow-up to the video I made two weeks ago. And in that video I'd referred to the possibility of an earthquake on February 29, as well as a clock time anomaly. And this is what it looked like on February 29. There was a slight increase in earthquakes, but it was nothing significant. In fact, it was a very quiet day. Uh, February 26 had actually seen more action. That was the Taiwan and uh, Russian earthquakes, and of course we've had other spikes, March 3rd, March 9, and March 14. As far as clock times, nothing else has happened there either. I paused my clock experiment back in January, and I restarted it on February 5th, and the clocks have been pretty random, it would seem. Uh, nothing obviously going on, no relationship between one fast clock and a slow clock. The fast clocks are not moving away from the slow clocks on a consistent basis. Um, they appear to be moving randomly. However, this original cube clock I had does still seem to be predictive for earthquakes. Um, as in, it would slow prior to earthquakes and speed up after earthquakes. And I think this is all referring to not a real-time anomaly itself, but something to do with uh, radio signals, electromagnetic waves affecting the crystals. So it's a slightly different idea than I was suggesting last year, but I think these are receiving some sort of electrical interference, electromagnetic interference. This one, for whatever reason, is tuned to it or more receptive to this. These are picking up electrical interference or electromagnetic interference from other sources, perhaps, which are nothing or little relationship to earthquakes, but this one, whatever the field of the Earth is, or the frequency that the Earth is resonating on, this is more receptive to it. So on the days that we actually had earthquakes, or significant earthquakes, I did record the seismographs. For example, March 3rd, March 9, and March 14. So let's have a look at some of these seismographs on the list service, the USGS list service. On March 3rd, 2012, there was a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake southeast of the Loyalty Islands. And on the USGS, this is what it looked like on the map. This is the location, just east of Australia, north of New Zealand, near New Mia. And March 3rd was actually the alignment between Earth, Moon, and Orion, or the object in Orion. There's also the date that this uh, orange fireball flew across the UK, heading northward. And it's also the date that there was a strange uh, air pressure anomaly in Thailand, it was reported, which pulled out windows from 7-Elevens blew over trees, uh, heavy gusts of wind and rain, and ceilings pushed up inside houses. Whether that's related to this orange fireball meteorite, I don't know. Whether it's related to this earthquake, or this earthquake's related to any of those things, I'm not sure, but this is a worldwide plate movement event again. So I'm the date today is March 8, so I can't click on any of these links. But I did keep this because it was the Orion alignment, so I was planning to make a video about it, and it's been sitting on my browser waiting for me to make the video. And I just heard news about uh, the events in Thailand on that day, and how it coincided with the orange fireball. So I thought it might be valuable to put this on video so you can see what the seismographs were looking like around that time. And this would be approximately midday UTC time when all this shaking was going on around the world. On 
March 9, 2012 at 7.09 a.m. UTC time. There's a magnitude 6.7 earthquake in Vanuatu. As you can see, this is one of those earthquakes which moved everything around the world. And this movement went on for about two hours. Then, on the 14th, there was a 6.9 recorded off the east coast of Japan at 9.08 a.m. UTC time. It was originally reported as being a 7.6, but has been downgraded to a 6.9. And there was a 6.1 recorded almost two hours later. And then a 5.9 recorded later on in the day. It's been downgraded to a 5.7. And there was a 6.2 off the uh, in Papua New Guinea. And this is what it looked like for those earthquakes on the day. This is a few hours after the first quake. As you can see, there's a movement all around the world again. And this is more like something in the range of a 7 for one of these global movement events. But anyway, they're calling it a 6.9 now. And this is what the seismographs looked like about five hours after the initial earthquake. As you can see, all the earthquakes seem to have joined into one big movement. I don't know how they differentiate one from another, but obviously these are not the most detailed charts. And this is actually the next day, and you can see on this chart, or these charts here, the Vanuatu earthquake, which was measured at a 6.2. So we've been looking at a 6.9, and now this is a 6.2. You see the tail end of the 6.9, and well, I guess that's a 5.9 they're calling it, 5.8 now, aren't they? Was it a 5.7 they've down that to? It's showing up here. The Vanuatu one, which was which is the 6.2, is here. Quite a contrast. So it was quite a significant earthquake, or series of earthquakes off the coast of Japan, compared to the one in Vanuatu. But it was actually quite a significant series of earthquakes that day. So let's have a look back at our earthquakes, tides, and alignments chart. And were there any alignments on the March the 14th? Well, in fact, there was. We're actually just passing the Pleiades alignment. That actually happened late on the 13th, and these earthquakes happened very early on the 14th, or they began very early on the 14th. So we're within like this 12 hour window of this Pleiades alignment, which, interestingly enough, is actually at the moment also the Elenin alignment, because Elenin's in the Pleiades now in that direction. So, okay, so we can explain away that as being the Pleiades, but how about March 9? Can we explain that away? Um, okay, it's too early to be this Orion, and of course it 
whether or not it's Orion or if we're looking the other way it's a galactic core um, but it's not Orion and it can't be Jupiter so this is a bit of an anomaly and it's just got my attention because it was a significant Earth movement and it was there on that day and I can't explain it and we've got one back here January 15 it also is out of place okay these things should really only go off when they're supposed to go off and they shouldn't go off at other times um, although it's generally fairly quiet for earthquakes anyway and it's quiet it becomes more random it seems to become it's with the really big ones which are really predictable so not the small ones so anyway I just thought I'd have a look at this and I had just noticed that these if I click on the right one the sea levels and this is the sea level change minimums and I'll have to go and explain what that all is again but this sea level change minimum for a buoy in the North Pacific is actually hitting the March, uh, the January 15 uh, spike in earthquakes and the March 9 one okay and then I made this other connection that well actually there's these minimums at the moment occurring on 14 and 13 and I think there was another 14 and a 13 am I right about that? yeah 13 another 14 day interval so that's really regular they're not well they had been regular last year but prior to that they really weren't that regular and this is that sea level minimum that I've been referring to in previous videos which is coincides with something in the direction of Leo. Well, last year that was matched very nicely with Elenin, and it seemed to pull in with the approach of Elenin, and then the correlation broke as Elenin rounded the sun. Well, the, this correlation still seems to be there with something in the region of Leo, or perhaps Virgo. And I decided, well, I better go and have a look at this. So what are these sea level change minimums and where does the data come from? Well, the data comes from the National Data Buoy Centre, part of NOAA. And I'm looking at buoys all around the world, but uh, for this particular sea level change minimum phenomena, it's actually more obvious within data coming from the Northern Pacific. But you also see it in Hawaii, Indian Ocean, all over the place. But in particular, I'm looking at a buoy in the Northern Pacific. Um, I haven't got time to look at every one of them. So, if you click on, say, one of these, you'll see there's a maximum sea level for the day and a minimum. In fact, this is every 12 hours. Okay, so there's a maximum of that and then a minimum. So, two maximums a day and two minimums a day. If we take the maximum and subtract the minimum, we get the change, the largest difference on the day, the difference between the highest high and the lowest low. So let's look at the sea level maximum minus minimums in the waters around Hawaii, for example. And you'll see that there's a nice wave pattern here, and it correlates very closely to the sun. For example, this is uh, the full moon, and this is the new moon. And we get a peak on the full moon, we get a peak on the new moon. So it's a very strong correlation between the moon and the sun and the sea levels in the waters around Hawaii. Excepting, you'll notice, say on March 9, with the day that it should be at a peak is actually dipped and we find it also actually on the 10th not the 11th but the 10th we've got another dip and we've got another little notch here on the 25th these are the dates that we notice in the buoy in the northern pacific that we have the minimums so what is actually happening it's almost as if on those particular dates the moon has lost its pull or it's lost its influence on the oceans and it's not able to pull the seas as it would normally and one interesting thing you might think well what's happening on this date well that's September 28 last year it was a day after Elenin was scheduled to pass between the earth and the sun and this is the sun Elenin alignment there so that's interesting so let's have a look back at these dates here and plot them on a top-down view of the solar system and see what we find <laughs> 